Welcome back to Introduction to Philosophy. In this lecture, we're going to start uh, introducing the philosophy of religion. In the last few lectures, we talked about <clears throat> several different moral theories, and I said that the, the, uh, the lecture, uh, that that particular part of the course was really too small, and, and then I said, well, there are full Introduction to Ethics courses that you can take if you want more information. This part of the course is only going to be three lectures long, and there are full um, classes that you can take on religion if you so choose. And This one is really just going to be able to get you introduced to a few ideas surrounding <clears throat> philosophy of religion and surrounding ideas about God, and, um, <clears throat> uh, and it's really just going to have to be an introduction. I'm having a little bit of a, an allergy issue, so I'm going to be clearing my throat and uh, I'm going to have a cough, cough drop in my mouth most of the lecture, so... <clears throat> Alright, so in an introduction to religion class, uh, one of the difficult things, or one of the things that we're going to be talking about in, in this particular course is just going to be mostly Western religion and mostly Western religion focused. It's not that the other religions don't have something to offer, and it's not that they're interesting. Uh, they, they do have things to offer, and they are very interesting. It's just that most of my students are Western, and so I focus on the philosophy of Western culture for the most part, and then um, I also have more training in that area as well, and so it's an area that I'm more comfortable with than I am with the Eastern religions. And so <clears throat> there are courses you can take on Eastern religions too, if that's something you're particularly interested in, but we'll fo focus mostly on the West. Um, in this particular lecture, we're going to make some assumptions. We're going to assume, for example, that there is a God for, you know, for most of this lecture, now, in the next lecture, we're going to talk about reasons for believing in the existence of God, and then in the third lecture, we're going to talk about the problem of evil, which is the primary reason for disbelieving in the existence of the Western God. And so, <clears throat> for now, though, just so we can kind of get the ball rolling and start talking about religion and start talking about God, um, just kind of, kind of assume that there is one and that we might have some idea of what some of his attributes might be. Uh, and... I'm not going to make that assumption as we move forward in the next two lectures, but for now, just to try to get us going, to get us thinking, um, <clears throat> you may have to make some assumptions there that, you know, maybe we'll be talking about God like God does in fact exist, and then we'll, we'll get into those discussions later on. All right, when it comes to trying to discuss um, world religions, what kind of activities or what kind of definition might we be able to give that would be broad enough to encompass the entirety of world religions or even Western religion, uh, even just simply God itself, is it possible really to simply define uh, the idea of God or the idea of religion and exactly what religion is? And <clears throat> one of the important aspects of trying to define religion, and remember in an earlier course I said it's really important to try to define your terms, and that's why we're starting here. One of the important aspects to trying to define religion is to understand that your definition uh, will most likely depend a lot on your starting point. And what that means is that if you start trying to define religion, uh, if you start from a perspective of scholasticism, or if you start from an academic perspective, that's going to influence your definition of what religion is. Versus, for example, if you start from more of a practitioner position, if you start from the practitioner's position, that definition of religion is going to look vastly different from the academic perspective. And so really defining religion can depend on where you're standing um, and how you're trying to approach what religion is. If you're approaching it from a lecturer's perspective like mine, you're probably not going to define it as a practitioner, even if you are a practitioner, even if I am a practitioner, I'm still not going to define it in that way just simply based on the setting that I'm in versus, say, uh, you know, someone over here who goes to this particular temple or synagogue or whatever it might be, and the way that they'll define what religion is is going to look really, really different simply due to the setting and the approach and how you're, you know, where you're standing will determine part of your definition. There are other ways that you can um, begin looking at religion. So, for example, <clears throat> um, uh, we talked about as a practitioner and academically, 
you can also approach it from a historical perspective and so that you're just say studying it or trying to understand it from a where did these people come from or how did they get to the belief that they have um, you can also approach it from an archaeological standpoint and so that you're out you know digging and trying to find old temples or trying to find old relics that were part of a religion and you're understanding it from an archaeological perspective and you can also understand it from a cultural perspective and then of course finally there's also the theological perspective and so your starting point can uh, really really influence your definition and so it makes it a difficult thing to try to define religion um, so defining religion can be a difficult thing to do <clears throat> what about the word God how do we define uh, what we mean when we say that word and just what exactly does that look like what does that being look like um, if I say the word God you know what's the first thing that pops into your head and lots of people you know it's the old guy sitting on a cloud in a white robe um, <clears throat> with the you know the the long white beard maybe that's the picture that pops in your head for others it might be something more like attributes and so defining God in Western civilization has often been about trying to understand the attributes that that being has and so even then though giving God certain attributes can be uh, a difficult thing or even a controversial thing certainly as we will see when we get to the problem of evil but even some of the most basic ones um, uh, for example uh, is God all-powerful is an attribute that's often attributed to God in Western culture <clears throat> meaning that there's nothing that God can't do that leads to all kinds of questions questions like um, can God create a stone that's so heavy you can't lift it can God create a square circle can God both exist and not exist at the same time <clears throat> I mean those are those kinds of questions that that can often lead to and I like to talk about those questions kind of briefly again just to kind of get my students minds engaged here um, I think that there's a pretty easy answer with a question can God create a stone so heavy that he can't lift it if you think about it from a, a mathematical perspective how do we represent infinity in a mathematical equation uh, or at least in like a geometrical equation it's that line and then with the arrow on each end <clears throat> that just means that the line goes on and it never ends and so that's infinite it's a line that's infinite um, and so what I'll do is, is I'll draw on a dry erase board you know one line that's six inches long and I'll put an arrow on each end and then draw a line that's 12 inches long and put arrows on each end and, <clears throat> and then ask my students which line is longest and of course the answer is neither you know, neither line is longer than the other they're both infinite they both have the same attribute in the sense of that they're both unending so think about it for just a second with God and the question of can God create a stone that's so heavy that he can't lift it well it's kind of a silly question really because if God's power is infinity and that's what we mean by all-powerful if God's power never ends then right now thinking about the question here in this way this is why it's supposed to be a tricky question that stumps people uh, in their belief in God if God can create a stone so heavy that he can't lift it then there is something God can't do namely lift the stone if God can't create a stone so heavy that he can't lift it then there is something God can't do namely God can't create a stone that's so heavy that he can't lift it now either way that you answer that then there's something God can't do and that's why it's supposed to be a really clever question the trouble with the question is like the lines that are drawn on the board you're asking one infinity to out infinity another infinity which is really kind of a silly thing to ask we understand that that's really not possible and so you're asking God to do something that's silly ultimately it's impossible or just downright <clears throat> uh, not something that we're gonna say can be done in that sense so you're asking an infinity to be more infinite than another infinity which is really just a silly question these kinds of questions are kind of a word magic type thing where you try to set something up that's impossible no matter which way you go right and it's not really all that powerful for those who believe in God uh, it's certainly not as powerful sometimes um, as people who don't believe in God want it to be it's not really that great of a question the second one here was <clears throat> can God create a square circle the definition of a square is that you've got four sides and each 
corner uh, of those um, of the four sides as they come together is a 90 degree angle. And a square, the definition is basically just that it has no, no angles, it has no sides, and it has no angles. And so, can God create something that both has angles, um, like sides and angles, and can God create something that has no sides and angles? Can God create something that has angles and sides and that doesn't have angles and sides? Yeah. Again, it's something that we would say and understand as basically being impossible. Um, although at this point, I <clears throat> I like to ask my or tell my students, you know, well maybe God can create a square circle, and while I don't believe that, that's, that's not what I'm really trying to say. What I'm trying to do is get my students' attention and say, look, just because you can't imagine something or just because you can't conceive of something doesn't mean that God couldn't do it. It just means that you can't conceive of it. It just means that you can't do it. But it doesn't mean that it can't be done and it can't be conceived of. So there's a story that I like to tell uh, that, that helps kind of illustrate uh, what God might be like in the sense of that we need to not limit God. Now, there was a, a German mathematician and philosopher named Leibniz, and Leibniz said, God can do anything that can be done, right? So maybe God can't exist and not exist at the same time, um, but God can do anything that can be done. But I think even that's a little too limited and limiting when it comes to what what most people mean when they're talking about God. So just a quick story to try to kind of illustrate uh, that God is, you know, really big, at least, again, that's kind of how we're assuming God to be, Western theology here. God's really, really big, and we shouldn't limit him to what we can conceive of and what we understand. So here's the story. <clears throat> Imagine that you, uh, well, you are a three-dimensional creature. Imagine that you're sitting at home in, in just your, your square, in, sorry, in your box, right? So you're sitting at home in your box, it's like a one-room apartment, and you're sitting there, <clears throat> and you're not watching TV or listening to anything, and suddenly a voice speaks to you out of nothing, and of course you freak out, because you're not used to voices speaking to you out of nothing. And then uh, the voice says to you, calm down, I'm a four-dimensional being, and I'm here to introduce myself to you. And so in a moment of calm and clarity, you ask the voice, you know, you're four dimensional. You're a four dimensional creature. I'm a three dimensional creature. What is it that you can do that I can't do? And the four dimensional creature says, "I can't explain it to you. Let me show you." And so the four dimensional creature whisks you away through a wormhole to a two dimensional universe. And there, there is a two dimensional being just like you, except that this being is sitting in its square. Right. So. Two dimensions, not three. Three dimensions, you're in your box. Two dimensions, he's in a square. And he's not watching TV or listening to anything either. And the four-dimensional being instructs you to speak to the two-dimensional being, so you do. And the two-dimensional being freaks out because it's not used to voices speaking to it out of nothing either. And you said, calm down, I'm a three-dimensional being, and I'm here to introduce myself to you. In a moment of clarity and, and calmness, <clears throat> the two-dimensional being says, well, you're three-dimensional, and I'm two-dimensional. What can you do that I can't do? And you say to the two-dimensional being, well, you can go up and you can go down. You can move forwards and backwards. And then you say to him, I can move side to side, right? That's just going to blow the two-dimensional being's mind. There's not going to be anything in its existence that will allow it to conceive of moving side to side. Let's think of it this way. Remember the old Mario game, the original ones, where it's just the two-dimensional Mario. He goes forward, backwards, up and down, but he doesn't step out of the screen, and he doesn't step through the back of the television. That's not something that Mario can do. Not only is it not something Mario can do, but the programming of the game uh, won't even allow Mario to conceive of this. That's not something that its reality can even comprehend, never mind trying to attempt. It's not something that it can even conceive of existing Never mind even conceive of uh, <clears throat> trying to behave according to the laws of a three-dimensional world. It's not even going to be able to think about what you're trying to tell it that it is. And so that's why the four-dimensional being can't explain itself to the three-dimensional being any more than the three-dimensional can explain itself to the two. It's not because the four-dimensional 
doesn't understand and doesn't have the words perhaps it's that the three-dimensional being doesn't have the capacity to think beyond its own three-dimensional existence there's no programming for that so <clears throat> some some scientists have hypothesized that there are up to ten uh, dimensions now the number I have seen uh, lately in the past few years has gone up to as high as 20 I think even 22 I'm just going to stick with 10 because it's nice and round uh, and I don't know right who knows how many dimensions there are but let's say there's 10 now if there are 10 and we can move in and conceive of things in three dimensions of those 10 that means that there are seven dimensions that we can't know of we can't act in we can't necessarily really even conceive of them and it's certainly not something that we can walk into and behave according to their laws because we are constrained by our three-dimensional being our three-dimensional selves if God's the ultimate being um, <clears throat> and that's kind of what we mean in Western theology when we talk about God then let's say God is that being who can act in ten dimensions and so maybe there is a dimension in which God can create square circles. Maybe that's possible. I don't think it's possible. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that of all the things that we can do, if there's another seven dimensions of things that we can't even conceive of, and if God can conceive of them and act in those as easily as you move side to side, maybe that's how easy it is for God to do seemingly impossible things. I mean, Because think about moving side to side to a two-dimensional creature you would seem like a god. You would seem like something that was so extraordinary if you could, you know, step into their into their square and then simply step out of it, and you could move through their reality like that. You would seem like a god to them. Maybe God really is a ten-dimensional creature that <clears throat> does things that seem really miraculous to us, but are really really simple and are really really not difficult. Uh, they're as undifficult as moving side to side is for us. That's a possibility. Uh, again, we're making the assumption that here God you know, exists and is like what we understand would be in Western theology. But hopefully that helps you think about um, who God is and maybe that we need to be careful not to make God too small um, as we're talking about him. Now that leads to other questions when it comes to God's abilities. <clears throat> Can God tell a lie? Uh, can God break a promise? Those types of things. Um, I have listened to any number of debates about that particular issue, whether or not God can't lie, right? God's perfect, and therefore God can't lie. Or God can lie because there's nothing that God can't do, therefore God can lie, but God won't lie. And so I've listened to those, those individuals debate those things, it's not something I really want to tackle here. I don't think it's useful for our particular purposes. Those questions are out there. If, uh, if you're interested, you can pursue that, certainly. Um, <clears throat> but the idea of can God do something that's evil um, leads us to the problem of evil or the question of evil. And so here, just kind of briefly, what is the problem of evil? And I'm going to lay it out in its classical, logical form uh, quickly here for you. Right, so how can there be evil in the world if God is, there's three attributes, if God is all-knowing, all-loving, and all-powerful? Now think about it for just a moment. If God's all-knowing, God would know how to prevent evil. If God is all-loving, God would want to prevent evil. And if God is all-powerful, God could prevent evil, right? And then the fourth part of that particular logical argument is evil is not prevented. There is evil, right? Evil is not prevented. And then the conclusion of the argument is, therefore, no such God exists, meaning no such God who is all-knowing, all-loving, and all-powerful exists. Now, this is the classical argument of evil and the way it's laid out in its logical progression. Um, like I said before, I am going to deal <clears throat> with that particular topic uh, for an entire lecture. At least I think I said it. Okay, so next lecture is going to be five arguments for the existence of God. It'll actually be six. Aquinas is five arguments, and then there's another one we'll add. And then um, the lecture after that will be the problem of evil and the reason to disbelieve in the existence of God. 
So I really don't want to spend a lot of time on that one today. I just want to introduce it to you so that you can be thinking about it. Maybe you'll try to come up with a solution for the problem of evil. You know, rewind the lecture uh, if you want to <clears throat> listen to it as it's laid out again in its classical form. And then maybe try to get an answer. But that's something we'll deal with in a later lecture. So I don't want to deal with it today. Even when doing something like um, just talking about God, it can be a difficult thing to do um, for two reasons, right? Defining religion is difficult. Defining God can also be difficult. Difficult for two reasons here that I want to touch on briefly. Um, <clears throat> if we talk about God in terms that are too common, that are too ordinary, we risk making God common and ordinary. So if we talk about God, and I'm, I'm thinking again, Western culture here, if we think about God as Father, fathers are pretty common things. I mean, lots of us, well, all of us have fathers. Lots of us are also fathers, and that's what I meant to say. Um, so fathers are really common, and it, it can make it sound like God is kind of common. Um, another one that's kind of common, and I'm going to say comical, uh, there is a part of the <clears throat> Jewish writing that describes uh, God as a mother hen who gathers her children under her wings, like a hen gathers chicks under her wings. And if you think about that for just a moment, does that really mean God really is like a mother hen, or does it mean something else? Obviously, well, uh, I'll say obviously it means something else, at least in the Western traditions that I'm used to. That kind of analogy uh, doesn't mean that God literally is like a hen. But we almost have to use those kinds of common, ordinary things like fathers and hens in order to comprehend God. But it's dangerous to use those kinds of common, ordinary things when we're talking about God because God is other than. He's something else than the rest of us. He's not common and ordinary. And so when you're talking about God this way, it's dangerous because he can become too common and ordinary. On the other hand, if we don't use that kind of common, ordinary language to describe God, then we can end the conversation before it begins. If we try to talk about God as being something that is so other, that is so different from all of us, um, that we don't have those kinds of common, ordinary experiences, then we can blow our own mind, meaning that we won't have anything to say because what we can really know and experience here is the common, ordinary things that we know and understand and experience here as humans, as mortals, uh, and so not as eternal, you know, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving creatures. And so you kind of have this, this danger on both ends, where trying to talk about God in too common a way is dangerous, and talking about God <clears throat> in too an extraordinary way is also dangerous. And so, you know, how do you kind of balance that? It can be a difficult thing to do. And since it can be such a difficult thing to do, some people have said that we need to rely on reason and reason alone when it comes to talking about God or, or figuring out what attributes God has. The trouble with that is that it's going to come up short. There's no way you can reason your way uh, purely, reason your way to, and this is who God is. It's not something we can do We'd have to have some type of evidence or some type of um, uh, common, ordinary things, that physical things, that we could look at and begin to think about and reason about. We can't just sit out here as a mind that's spinning, uh, using nothing but logic and understand who God is. It's not something we can really do. And so some people have said you can't rely on reason. Instead, you have to rely on faith in order to know who God is. The trouble with only relying on faith faith. Um, <clears throat> is that faith without reason, faith without logic, is unguided. If you simply have faith, then you could just have faith in almost anything, uh, and not for any good reason, but you still believe in it. And so, um, you might have faith that the moon is made of cheese. Why do you have that faith? No reason. You don't need reason. You just have faith that the moon is made of cheese. There needs to be something more to it than just, I believe. And so, uh, within a lot of religious traditions, especially Western ones, uh, what you'll find is that there's a lot of faith and reason that, you know, they're trying to get them to work together to come up with some type of, and here's what we believe, and here's why we believe what we believe. And, of course, 
Uh, th- I mean, that's, I say of course, but that's one of the big pushes in my class uh, that I talk about, not just that you believe in something, why do you believe in it? And so with God, it's exactly the same thing. And so maybe you believe in God. Why do you believe in God? What caused you? What reasons do you have for thinking that this being exists? Maybe you don't believe in God. Why? What reasons do you have for disbelieving in that particular being's existence? And so both sides, right? not just faith, not just, well, I believe or I don't believe, but why? What, what good reasons do you have? What good sound, logical thinking have you put in the, into this that would somehow um, say, and here, this is, this is one reason I believe or I disbelieve. And that's going to be part of what we're going to be looking for through this course. All right. Um, yeah, so back to kind of the idea of religions being defined. Uh, one of the questions I get is, why can't we just look for something that all of them have in common and then define religions according to that? Well, as you start looking for things that they have in common, and I just ask my students, you know, kind of poll the class, and inevitably somebody, you know, pops up and says, well, you know, they all believe <clears throat> uh, in God. No, they all don't. Um, Taoism doesn't, for example. They don't have a god. Um, and even as you look at Buddhism, they, they have a, a oneness, you know, this kind of thing that is out there and is all, and all is in it. Um, they have that kind of oneness, but that oneness um, is not a being. It's not an entity. It's not a person like Western religions tend to understand uh, God as a, as a person, having personhood. And so <clears throat> um, it's, you, yeah, so you can't just say God because some of them don't have it, and they, even then, the, the different gods that they have, or the different ideas about God that they have, uh, are going to separate these religions, and, and very, very quickly. Um, they don't all meet in houses of worship. There are some religions that don't. Uh, Wicca uh, doesn't usually, that I know of, doesn't have just a house of worship. They might go to someone's house, but they don't necessarily have you know a building that's set aside uh, necessarily to come in and worship. Um, they're not all going to have the kind of things that most of us think of when we think of religious practice. Um, not all of them are going to necessarily pray or necessarily pray in the same capacity. Um, so defining it by what all of them have in common, even a sacred text, a lot of religions have a so-called sacred text, but their understanding of a sacred text, say in Buddhism, is not the same as, like, say, the Bible in, uh, in the Western world. It's a different concept of what the texts are good for and useful for. Um, but they're not, they're not God's word to humanity. It's, well, it's different things in Buddhism, and I, this is not a, a lecture series on sacred texts. So they don't really have sacred texts that behave the same way uh, as they do necessarily in Western culture. Um, as far as I know, like as my thinking has gone through this, um, I do think, as far as I know, all religions do have rituals. Now, there might be some out there that don't, <clears throat> but as far as my knowledge goes, they do all have rituals. But simply saying that something has rituals is not sufficient for saying, and therefore it's a religion. If that were the case, Baseball would be a religion. Now, some people consider baseball to be a religion, but if you know anything about baseball players, you know that they're some of the most ritualistic individuals you'll ever meet. So on game day, many of them will eat exactly the same food um, uh, every time before a baseball game. Uh, if they go to, <clears throat> if they're in their home city, they have a routine they go through. If they're in an away city, they develop a routine in that city. Uh, if you watch a baseball player step into the batter's box, there is a ritual that they go through, getting themselves ready to attempt, you know, to uh, to hit the ball. I mean, there is a, a and, and it's very detailed, you know. And the bat has to, you know, so tighten this glove, tighten that glove. You know, bat's in the right hand, tap, tap, comes up to the ready. You know, whatever the ritual is, there's a ritual involved, but baseball isn't. 
a religion. So humans have rituals that we go through um, uh, in lots of different ways, in lots of different capacities that may or may not have anything to do with religion. So simply saying it has rituals doesn't qualify as a religion in this case. So looking for something that all of them have in common can be a difficult thing to do. It can be a difficult thing to find. There are some things I think that maybe they do all have in common, but I don't think those things are adequate simply to say, and here, therefore all religions are you know, these things, and therefore you defined it. It can be a very, very difficult thing to do to define them. Some people have tried to define them by putting them into families or groups. Um, the three groups most common are monotheistic, polytheistic, and pantheistic. Monotheism is what we're most used to. Mono just in, in Greek, mono means one, and theo, by the way, means God, T-H-E-O. And so a uh, monotheistic religion is one that has one God. Polytheism is, poly means many, and so many gods, many theos. And then pantheistic is the word for all or every. And so God is in all things or in everything, and everything is part of God. And that's what it means to be pantheistic. And so the entirety of the universe is part of God, and God is you know, within all of the universe. <clears throat> Those groupings are useful in that they... They're a convenient way to catalog them. You know, these religions are monotheistic, these are polytheistic, these are pantheistic. Well, that's useful for, like say, putting them in a textbook into those groups, but it doesn't really tell us anything about the religions. So if you look at monotheism and you look at Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, I mean, there are going to be some vastly different aspects to those religions, and simply saying they're all monotheistic isn't therefore just going to handle the problem of, you know, uh, how we define those three different religions. They're going to be quite, quite different. So there's going to be more to it than just that. Um, another way you can try to define religion is by its ex extrinsic qualities, meaning um, what happens on the outside uh, of the religion, and that can mean on the outside of the religion uh, as an organization, or it can mean on the outside of the religion of the people. Uh, so extrinsic, meaning out, like the word exit means out, or the word intrinsic, <clears throat> you can just hear the word in, meaning on the inside, which is what we'll talk about in, this mo in a moment. So you can define a religion simply by what happens on the outside of it, but certainly that's not going to be fair, that's not going to be adequate, because there's going to be things that do happen on the outside for some individuals that aren't necessarily a reflection on the religion itself. They may behave in such a way that is not appropriate or not according to um, the religion and what the religion teaches. And so just because an organization or individuals within it behave in a certain way, it doesn't mean that you've got a proper definition of the, uh, the religion itself. Intrinsically, <clears throat> um, I, I think probably more helpful is the intrinsic aspect in the sense of that most when you're reflecting on how religion behaves on the inside, what you're looking for is how does the function and the practice of this religion draw a person, and here I'm going to go Western again, draw a person towards um, God or towards the holy or perhaps towards the moral or perhaps towards you know, a particular lifestyle. So inside, looking at the religion simply on the inside, um, it is helpful, but again, it's not enough when it comes to simply defining what religion is. There's more to religion than simply what happens on the inside or the outside. And so, <clears throat> yeah, it's helpful to understand how a religion um, reflects and how it helps people, but... You know, that's not ultimately going to help us as we're trying to define it. Um, one of the things that religion is at least supposed to um, help with is, and I'm thinking from the inner perspective here, is that it's supposed to try to help us find some type of meaning in, in life or some type of purpose or some type of, I'm going to say, to be more inclusive of the Eastern religions, some type of way meaning some type of way of living or some type of way of, of being the thing you're supposed to be. And so when we start talking about religion and meaning, the question becomes very quickly, <clears throat> well, can religion 
offer uh, meaning to to us, and if it can or if it can't, what kind of meaning? What what's that meaning look like? How how does religion offer that kind of meaning or purpose? Now, as you're looking at life and trying to find meaning and purpose in life, there's lots of different theories and ways, and there are those individuals. Um, we're gonna you know go back. Well, okay, so. Most people are looking for meaning and reason, and so there are lots of different opinions about where meaning and re reason can come from. Uh, Christians and Muslims think that life is that this life, the meaning of this life, is to prepare us for the next life. Confucius believe that believe that this life is about being the most socially ordered individual that you can be. A while ago in the lecture, I think I said Taoists don't believe in a deity, and I meant Confucius. So Confucius are the ones not believing in the deity. I mixed my Easterns there. So, um, okay, so back to this part. So Confucius believe that it's about being the most socially ordered individuals that you can be. Hindus and Buddhists believe that you are in a cycle of lives and that you eventually lose yourself. And so you can, through reincarnation, uh, in collecting the correct kind of karma, you can leave the endless cycle of lives, and you can go be, uh, you can go become one with the the great one that we were talking about a minute ago. And so, all of these different religions have different meanings and purposes, th things that they think this life is meaningful and purposeful about. Um, now, there are those <clears throat> who believe that life has no meaning, and sometimes they're called absurdists and sometimes they're called existentialists. And so the existentialists, those writers, say that there is no meaning to life. And so trying to find meaning in any aspect of life is meaningless, uh, whether it be religious or any other part of life. And so some of the, <clears throat> uh, some of the absurdist writers, some of the uh, existential writers, and give them kind of a fair shot here. Um, one such writer was named Emilio. He was an ancient writer, his, and he wrote, and this is a quote from Emilio, he says, All life is a shadow of a smoke wreath, an empty gesture in the air, a hieroglyphic traced in the sun for an instant in the sand, and effaced a moment afterwards by breath of wind, an air bubble expanding and vanishing on the surface of the great river of being, an appearance of vanity, a nothing. Now, I think that first line is really, really... Um, telling, because it said that all life is a shadow of a smoke wreath. It's not even a smoke wreath. It's not even a shadow. It's the shadow of a smoke wreath. I mean, it's that. Uh, it, it moves and changes and matters so insignificantly. Uh, if you've ever sat on the edge of a river and seen a bubble come up on the river and then pop a moment later, what he's saying is that our lives and this planet and humanity we're all as insignificant as that bubble that came up and a moment later disappeared that's how meaningful we are that's how much purpose we have that's how important we are just simply a bubble on the river of existence that comes up and goes away almost as quickly as it came so that is one of the existential writers, or one of the absurdist writers. Now, uh, Nietzsche is one of the existential writers <clears throat> um, who, even Nietzsche said that any meaning is better than no meaning. And so he strove, although he, he thought ultimately life didn't really have meaning and purpose, but he strove to find meaning and purpose in things like great artistic achievements or even uh, great human creativity. Um, and so even in Nietzsche, who was a very pessimistic uh, individual and writer, even he said some meaning is better than no meaning. Uh, we see another existential writer by the name of Kierkegaard, and Kierkegaard said <clears throat> that in order to find any kind of meaning, we have to take a leap of faith. And so you can't reason your way to meaning or to purpose. 
And Kierkegaard is going to be a rare type of existentialist. He's going to be a Christian existentialist, which seems kind of oxymoronical, but it's what he was. And so <clears throat> he said that what you have to do is you have to place your faith in God and leap. And what he means is that imagine that you're trying to jump over a huge ravine or a chasm or a, a Grand Canyon, okay? You know you can't jump that far. And so what you have to do is kind of depend on the fact that if I run and I jump, then you're going to, you know, expect that somehow, you know, God catches you. You have to take a leap of faith, uh, and that's where you're going to find God, and that's where you're going to find meaning and purpose. That was Kierkegaard's opinion. There was still another fellow, another existentialist by the name of Camus, um, and in his writings, one of the things <clears throat> that Camus um, talks about is that, you know, no, there's no meaning, no, there's no purpose, but at least while we're here, while we're alive, we have the opportunity to help and to assist and to, um, uh, to, to be there for each other. So Camus um, wrote a work called A Man for All Seasons, and in that work he talked about, um, he told a story about a young lawyer who was out on the streets of Amster Amsterdam, oh, let's say like 2 o'clock in the morning, in the early morning, <clears throat> um, and this is back when there's no electricity, so it's just street lights, like street lamps, gas lamps, that kind of thing, so it's very dimly lit, and this young lawyer was in the, um, he was in the red light district, right, so it's dark, and it's kind of seedy, and, you know, it's the bar section of town, and as he's walking through the streets, he hears a cry for help, And he knows that it's a woman's voice. And he takes a step towards the voice to help, and then he checks himself and he thinks for a moment. What if <clears throat> what if she is a prostitute who, you know, when I come around a corner, she's going to attach herself to me and then they're going to photograph me and blackmail me? Or what if she is um, part of a gang? And she's calling for help, and then whoever responds to help, um, they, they beat me up and perhaps kill me and then rob me. Or what if she's drowning, and I jump in to try to help her, and then I drown myself. And so as the young lawyer is deliberating about all these scenarios, about what, <clears throat> um, what this cry for help might be, you know, who this person who's crying for help, what the real situation might be, um, he realizes that as he's pondering this, that the cries for help have ceased. And he becomes overcome with his guilt, uh, with his what's called his sin of omission, meaning that he failed to act, he failed to try to help. And so he runs into one of the taverns, and immediately he begins to confess his sins there to the bartender, that sin of omission. And <clears throat> Camus judges the man by saying, he didn't answer the cry for help. That is the man he was. And I think what Camus here is saying, and I think it's very telling, is we're looking for this meaning and we're looking for the purpose. Um, whether God exists or not, uh, whether we can know uh, meaning and purpose in this life, uh, whether it really does exist or really doesn't exist, I think one thing that we can know, and I, this is very well pointed out here in Camus, is that there are plenty of people around us who do need help and who are crying out for help. And I think that that is, or can be at least, part of the purpose and part of the meaning that our lives can have. And from my perspective, and this is my opinion, apparently I'm throwing that in more and more often, um, that it should be part of our lives as well. So maybe there's no meaning, maybe there's no purpose, as these existentialists here are saying, um, Maybe that meaning comes from within us, like uh, Nietzsche is going to say, or like a Kierkegaard says, maybe it's something we just have to take a blind leap of faith. Or maybe, as Camus said, you know, that meaning and purpose really just is to try to help <clears throat> those individuals around us who are, who are calling for help. Um, 
but I think as we look here, I, I think there's one last aspect I wanted to talk about, one last philosopher, when it comes to thinking about life's meaning. Sorry. And in a way, I'm kind of going back here to Kierkegaard, who talks about the blind leap. Um, there's a Russian philosopher by the name of Leo Tolstoy, and Tolstoy was a wealthier Russian aristocrat who, after um, quite a while in his life, he had kids and he had, he had quite a bit of wealth, he began to wonder at life's meaning and at life's purpose because the joys of life that he had found, um, the older he got, the less meaningful they became. Let me get rid of this. <clears throat> and so he started wondering if there really was any kind of meaning or purpose in life. And as he looked around, he, he, he said this, and I'll talk a little bit about what this means. But here's what he said. One can only live while one is intoxicated with life. As soon as one is sober, it is impossible not to see that it is all a mere fraud and a stupid fraud. It is that is precisely what it is. There is nothing either amusing or witty about it. It is simply cruel and stupid. <clears throat> very existential, very meaningless, right? And one of the stories that Tolstoy tells, uh, it's, a, it's a parable, he tells about a man who is fleeing from a beast, right? So he's fleeing across a field or a, an open plain. And <clears throat> he sees a well, and he runs to the well and jumps into the well because he's seeking protection from the beast that is chasing him. And there he is safe in the well because as he was falling in, he grabbed a branch that was growing from the side of the well. Uh, and as the man is clinging there to that branch, he looks up and can see the beast, but as he looks beneath him into the well, he sees that the well is really an abyss, that it has no end. <clears throat> and so that if he lets go of the branch, he will fall certainly into the abyss as well. So now it's hopeless because there's a beast above and there's an abyss below. And so he's clinging there to the branch, and as he's clinging to the branch, two mice come and start chasing each other around the branch, and as they chase each other, they gnaw at the branch. Uh, and one of the mice is black and the other is white. And so it's just those two are chasing each other and gnawing on the branch the whole time. So that eventually, of course, this branch is going to break. And he's going to fall into the abyss. So now he has a choice. The beast above, the abyss below, the mice are slowly cutting the branch. And as he is clinging there, pondering his position, he sees a bit of honey that is on one of the leaves of the branch that he's clinging to. And he reaches out with his tongue and he takes the honey, and it is sweet, but it is only sweet for a time, and after a time he begins to realize that the honey loses its flavor, that it no longer brings him pleasure. And so then he is simply there clinging to the branch, watching the mice gnaw, and understanding that his doom... So Tolstoy is pondering the impending doom, right? Because the beast above and the abyss below, the, the mice are chasing each other, the mice represent day and night, uh, and he understands that over time, at some point, the branch is going to break. He's going to die. And he's going to die either at the, you know, because of the beast above or because of the abyss below. But those really are his options. And so the <clears throat> honey represents the good things in life that he has come to taste. But he realizes after a while that they don't taste good anymore. The, the things that pleased him before, they don't please him any longer. And so as he looks around the world, he comes to see that there are actually five ways of looking at the world. And uh, sometimes it's called Tolstoy's four ways, sometimes it's called Tolstoy's five ways. There are five, ultimately. <coughs> Originally there were four. He came to a fifth view that he adopted. But the first of Tolstoy's five ways is the way of ignorance. And he said that some people in the world, they, they don't know. They genuinely don't know that ultimately it's the beast above, the abyss below, and that over time those mice are going to chew through the branch uh, and he is going to fall. So they are ignorant. They don't understand. They don't have knowledge. Now, ignorance is not stupidity. 
Ignorance is the lack of knowledge. Stupidity is knowledge that you don't act on or that you misact on. Ignorance just means that you don't have knowledge. So they just didn't know. And you might be one of these people who goes through life who really doesn't understand the absurdity of life or uh, how bad life might actually be. There are those individuals who don't know. And Tolstoy said that's, that's one way of looking at the world. There's this group of people. The second group of people that he saw uh, in the world were called Epicurists, and they, he, this is the Epicurist response to this absurd situation that you find yourself in. Beast above, abyss below, he said, look around, grab all of the good taste that you can get while you're here uh, on earth, right? While you have the chance, before you meet your end, uh, just enjoy all the days and nights that you can. And Tolstoy said, that's another view, that some people do see the world in this way, uh, and that they respond uh, at the, to the absurdity by seeking for pleasure. The third way is what he called the way of strength. Now, this way is the individuals who see the absurdity of life and how bad it is, uh, and instead of enduring life's troubles that they commit suicide. Now, it's called the way of strength because Tolstoy here is saying that it takes a really strong person to end their own life. And so he said that <clears throat> a rope around one's neck, water, a knife to stick in one's heart, heart, or trains on a railway, all of these different ways that one could kill themselves. And he said it, it takes a lot of strength to do this, and that's why he called it the way of strength. The fourth way was the way that Tolstoy said was his way uh, <clears throat> until he found his fifth. But this fourth way was what he called the way of weakness. And this is the person who sees the absurdity of life and knows how bad it is, but they don't have the strength to commit suicide. And so rather than going out and facing the absurdity and being strong and just saying, I'm not playing the game and ending your life, Tolstoy said he just wasn't strong enough. And so that... He knew how bad it was, he knew how absurd it was, but he just didn't have the ability, he didn't have the strength to take his own life. So he lived in this way of weakness until he said that he found his fifth way. And the fifth way was a response of faith in God. And in this fifth way he said, Tolstoy said, I should have long ago killed myself had I not had a dim hope of finding him. I live, really live, only when I feel him and seek him. And so, ultimately, Tolstoy did find purpose in life, and he had the ability to escape the absurdity and the doom uh, simply by saying that there's more to life, this life, but there's also going to be more to uh, an afterlife. And Tolstoy, in this case, was a Christian, although uh, he was Russian Orthodox, um, kind of originally, he... He didn't accept the Russian Orthodox position on everything because he said that they were really just a tool being used by the Russian government. And so he wasn't really an Orthodox Russian Orthodox. He wasn't true, truly Russian Orthodox, but he was Christian. And he said, so, yeah, there's, there's more to this life and there's going to be something to the afterlife as well. And so he found peace and he found meaning uh, there in his Christian religion. <clears throat> Now, a lot of people um, who don't believe in God or who think religion's a waste of time or uh, you know, is it a daydream or, um, uh, well, in some way false, that they, a fairy tale, that's the word I was looking for, uh, that they think religion's really just a fairy tale. A word of caution to them and then a word of caution on the other end, too. So, it's important... Um, not to to qu too quickly declare that someone's religious uh, experiences are something that's only in the mind of that individual. Um, remember back to William James, who said that all experience is the experience of someone, and it's not the job of science or philosophy to dismiss those things out of hand. 
but rather it's the job of science and philosophy to try to deal with those experiences as they're had. It's important not to just dismiss religious experiences out of hand simply because you've never had one. So if you've never had a religious experience, you shouldn't just say, well, I've never had one, therefore there's no such thing. It's just in the heads of people who uh, think they're having these experiences, and, and they're really not. It, it's, it would kind of be like somebody who's never had the experience of falling in love, declaring, therefore, that there's no such thing as love. Love is one of those, falling in love, is one of those deeply personal experiences that it is impossible to explain to someone uh, or to, to, to really have them grasp until it's happened to them. And so in my class, I'll start a discussion and I'll have people in my classroom raise their hands and say, yes, I've fallen in love before. Um, and then I'll have them describe their experiences to people in the room who've never fallen in love. And you know, I'll let them go for five or ten minutes, and then I'll say, great, and now everybody in the room who has never fallen in love, now you know exactly what it's like to fall in love, don't you? And of course the answer is no. They don't know what it's like to fall in love because it is deeply subjective. It's, deeply, it's a deeply personal experience falling in love, and religious experiences are, are just like that. Until so you've had one, no explanation is really going to help you grasp what it's like to actually have a religious experience. But to simply dismiss it because you've never had the experience uh, would be foolish. It would be a, a, a misstep in logic. Just because you've not experienced it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Uh, and so you have to be really, really careful with that. And so I do a lot of um, uh, looking around on the internet. <clears throat> I watch a lot of videos, uh, debates, um, um, about the existence of God. And sometimes I read the comments, like if I really just am in the mood to uh, punish myself for something that I've done, I'll read the comments. Because a lot of times I see those kinds of comments like that, that you know, God's just a figment of, you know, everybody else's imagination. Well, that's a little bit arrogant uh, of the individual who's making the statement, well, everybody who believes in God is just a fool. And I mean, that, that may be true, but we have to be careful. And people believe in God for different reasons. Um, and maybe there's a reason out there that, you know, you haven't heard yet, and you should suspend belief. Uh, until maybe you've done more research or had more experience. Um, but we shouldn't just dismiss other person's experiences simply out of hand. It's called prima facie, on the face, just because it's, you know, this thing, and so it's just dismissed. We need to be careful about that kind of, um, that kind of thinking and that kind of dismissal. Um, yeah, so that's kind of a, just a, a, a warning, kind of a suggestion for those of you maybe... <clears throat> Uh, who who just disbelieve and and therefore I'm um, you know kind of done with it. Um, maybe there's something more to it, and we should spin belief. On the other hand, for those uh, um, for those who do believe in God and who claim to have had religious experiences, for those who have never had a religious experience, they can't just accept that you've had this experience. They're gonna have they're gonna demand something else. You can't expect them to believe simply because something happened to you and you believe you had a religious experience. We can't just accept it. Just like they shouldn't just reject it out of hand, other people can't just accept out of hand that you've had a religious experience either. And so that might be evidence to those of you who've had a religious experience of God's existence. That can be very good evidence for you but it's not going to convince someone who has never had the experience because it's not something that they can really know. And so what we're going to turn to in the next <clears throat> lecture um, are arguments for believing in the existence of God. These are arguments that can be put forward um, in such a way that everyone can explore them in an equal way. Uh, meaning that we can all see and understand the arguments. We can't all see and understand each other's religious experiences, but we can see and understand and critique in a positive way 
uh, the arguments for the existence of God. So what we're going to do next time is we'll turn to those arguments and we'll try to see if there are any good reasons for believing that this God exists above and beyond, say, personal experience. And then the lecture after that with the problem of evil, we'll see if there's any good reasons for disbelieving the existence of God, uh, again, above and beyond, the, in that case, the lack of personal experience. And so that's where we're headed in the next two lectures. And... We'll see you then.